A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hi everyone, I'm Anna Garcia and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast. This is a special edition. This is part three of our investigation into this insane fraud that was perpetrated by Jose Lantigua. Joining us is the insurance investigator who has been giving us all of the background of what was going on behind the scenes. Richard Marquez, you were the lead investigator. Thanks for helping us with this. I appreciate being on the show and uh, hope I can provide some uh, additional details to the story. So this is when it gets really interesting because this is the point now when Jose Lantigua and Daphne are about to be arrested. Take a look. Jose Lantigua is laying low in his secret hideaway in Venezuela. He went through quite a bit of trouble and pain. Quite a few people who corroborated their story to show that he actually passed away. But now Jose is about to do something even more dramatic than rising from his own dead ashes. Apparently, Mr. Lantigua is an extremely convincing storyteller. By sneaking back into the United States. Lantigua then pays $5,000 to get a boat ride because it's just about 60 miles off the coast for Nassau across to Fort Lauderdale. He takes a Greyhound up I-95, comes to Jacksonville, stays at an airport hotel. The next morning, Daphne picks him up. Lantigua holes up in the couple's mountain retreat, nestled at the end of a long driveway hidden by tall pine trees. His children have no idea daddy's home. His wife, Daphne, did have family visit in that house in North Carolina at Christmas time and Thanksgiving and he would stay at a hotel because he'd move out so they didn't know he's alive. But Lantigua apparently did see trouble coming. Remember that panic room we told you about? It's a safe house, a safe room is what it was called. It was something he had insisted on having built into the house. The bunker in his basement was designed to withstand a nuclear attack. It was equipped with 20 inch thick steel doors. And something like that can come in handy when you're hiding. Which is interesting because this house was purchased on your honeymoon. Yeah. And he said he wanted to do renovations. He renovated the whole house, yes. So he was already planning, apparently. Jose then gets busy creating a new identity. He applies for a North Carolina driver's license using a stolen ID. But his next move to create a new life will be his last. He makes a dreadful mistake. He applies for the passport in the United States government. On his passport application, Jose uses the name of Ernest Wills, an African-American postal worker. But that was just the beginning of Jose's missteps. Jose actually listed the address of that mountain house in North Carolina and Daphne as the emergency contact. What turns out to be another dumb move. He had the Department of State on him and they knew the passport was supposed to be delivered to a post office box in North Carolina. Though he changed his look for his passport picture, going from gray hair to a brown toupee and a fake goatee, it seems three mistakes was a charm. What had happened is Lantigua previously had a passport. He submits a passport again. Both of them were handwritten, same handwriting. Pictures come back and they match the faces because of the measurements between the nose and the eyes and the ears. And so the hunt was on. One of the things that was revealed in this investigation is that Jose eventually made his way back to the United States and was actually never too far away either from his home in North Carolina or his home in the Jacksonville, Florida area. I also suspected that. Because do you see do you see that a lot where where the person actually comes back to family and to familiar areas? 90% of the time. When uh, people were looking for Osama bin Laden, 
and everybody was speculating that he was hiding in a cave. I told all my friends, I said, no, he's living in a city inside of a house close to his family because everybody, human nature is so predictable. We all, we all like, if we're used to comfort, we want to live in a comfortable area. If we have family, we want to be close to our family because that gives us a secure feeling. So typically when somebody disappears, it's always a good idea to look, look around their surroundings. The person usually stays very close to home. Does, I mean, a few of them do go to the Maldives and things like that. There have been unbelievable cases of people who have faked their deaths oh, and yeah, end yeah, up yeah. in faraway, you know, exotic I lands. But, and we handle a lot of those investigations. <laughs> I bet you did. And <laughs> you probably know which one I'm talking about, too, in the Maldives. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but for the most part, the people who fake their deaths do stay close to home. I find that fascinating. Typically, they do, yes. If they can go back and they have the, uh, the means and the, uh, the legal way to come back to the States, for example, if they're traveling abroad. There's a case, actually, we didn't work this case, but it was a guy that lived in the UK. And um, I believe he was uh, traveling in Panama and was canoeing and allegedly disappeared during the canoe trip. So his wife had him pronounced dead and she got a declaration of, of death and she filed for the insurance pro proceeds. As it turned out, they ultimately found out that he had been living in his wife's house all the time. They had told, his, the mother told both of the sons that their father had passed away and when they would come to visit him, they would, he would hide in the basement. But eventually the guilt, he could see his sons leaving the house with their kids. The guilt finally got to him that he turned himself in, and, but claimed that he had had amnesia and, and didn't remember coming back to, uh, to the UK. <laughs> Isn't that convenient? Yeah, but he was living right there with his wife. Oh, my God. All right. Um... So how difficult, how difficult would you say is it to be a fugitive on the run, Pre you know, hiding, pretending that you're dead? Is that a really difficult thing to pull off? It's very difficult. I mean, it's, uh, it's probably one of the most challenging investigations we conduct is trying to find missing people. Because if somebody wants to hide, it's a big world. And, uh, you know, you're talking about technology. You can now create a synthetic identity, change your identity, get a different passport. You can buy a passport off the Internet, probably, and go travel and go live in. If you live in Texas, you can go live in Spain. Then how are you going to find somebody in a small town in Spain? Right. And he was quite stupid when he filled out the application and he had to write down an emergency contact and address. He used his real address for the house in North Carolina. How yeah. stupid is that? Well, like I mentioned earlier, fraudsters may be very bright, but they always make stupid mistakes. Yeah, that was a big one. <laughs> That's so stupid. I mean, I have to laugh at it, but it just it. And it was right then at that point that the investigation took a massive turn. And it wasn't too long after that that they arrested him. Yeah. And it was incredible that the uh, the uh, law enforcement agency that uh, that took on the investigation were the people from the passport office. That, well, they probably read the articles because there was a lot of articles and news of it by Mr. Lantigua and the litigation. So they probably looked at the application and then they started putting two, two and two together and probably did a Google search and found out he was missing in Venezuela or had died in Venezuela. Yet somehow someone was using his address in North Carolina. I did love this one story about Jose's crazy escapades that one Thanksgiving, he's now supposed to have been dead like a year or two. And the family went up to the North Carolina house for Thanksgiving. So he had to hide and stay at a motel in town while his family had Thanksgiving. Oh, and he <laughs> that they had several events there. I think one of his uh, children got married there at the uh, in North Carolina. Uh, he was uh, allegedly had, had allegedly passed away, so he must have known about the wedding and some of those events they had up there. He was probably dressed as a caterer. <laughs> Possibly. 
<laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Again, but but just the sheer audacity to literally be waiting in a hotel nearby while your family is celebrating Thanksgiving in the North Carolina home is just amazing. I mean, was he out there with binoculars watching? <laughs> Only he knows. Up next, Jose has no idea that his life is about to take yet another dramatic turn. Take a look. The feds run secret surveillance on Lantigua. And after a year and a half, they finally get their man. He had been having work done on his Jeep. And when we got to the place to pick up his Jeep, these agents were already there. And they got him, and they handcuffed him and arrested him. Jose Lantigua immediately confesses and confirms that he is Jose Lantigua. He was wearing a toupee. He had dyed his facial hair. The couple is immediately separated for questioning. One of the agents came over to me, and this whole time that this has been going on, he's always been telling me, you know, I have to be this person. Identity was supposedly the CIA had given him. So when the agent came and said, who is that? I did what he had told me to do. And I said, that's my friend. And I gave his name. And the agent looked at me and he said, I'm going to ask you again. I'm a federal agent. You can't lie. But I was so terrified and so thinking of protecting him and my family. I lied again. And that's when they arrested me. The evidence is overwhelming. Remember, his life insurance policy supposedly worth six million? It turns out he forged it. Jose really only had about $38,000. Jose and Daphne eventually both pleaded guilty. He's convicted of conspiracy and bank fraud. The judge sentenced him to 14 years in the pen. I think it was well-deserved. He will be in his 70s when he gets out of prison. He made a decision, he made a bed, and he's gonna have to sleep in it. And Daphne faced up to five years in jail for conspiracy. She wound up serving 17 months. But even while sitting in the slammer, Jose still had her under his spell. My family hired a lawyer to defend me. And I sat with him for three hours, and I told him everything. And he kept telling me, he said, Daphne, that's all a lie. You were duped. And I'm like, no, it's the truth. And you'll see, because the government's going to expose it and tell the truth. It's all the truth. She was in there for months and believed wholeheartedly that her husband was telling the truth and she was waiting every day for the CIA to come and fix it all. Wow. Do you believe that the wife really didn't completely know what her husband was up to? I have my, my suspicion, but I'll leave it at that. Only she knows. Yeah, it was interesting because even the prosecutor on this case, which I was you know, I interviewed Daphne and even I kept asking her, it's like, but how could you believe that? You know, because her story is that she believed the crazy story that the cartel was out to get him and that he had to fake his death or the cartel would kill him and their children. Yeah. So the prosecutor in this case said that he honestly believed that she thought that he had conned her into believing that he indeed was being chased by the cartel. And this was the only way to save him and the family was to fake the death. Do you believe that she was that gullible? Well, that's what she said. But again, I have my own opinion, but it, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to myself. <laughs> Yeah. And I honestly, Richard, after interviewing her at length, yeah. I mean, she cried a lot. She was very embarrassed. Well, yeah, I think I think she really wanted to believe that she had found love again. And for a while there, everything was so perfect. 
the yeah. perfect husband. He's a successful millionaire. He's yeah. providing for her adult children. All of a sudden, you know, she has a chance at love again. Yeah. So I think she wanted to believe him. But I mean, the story is just so unbelievable. Well, I've interviewed a lot of people in my life and um, I, I would like to interview her and I would talk to her now and just ask her. But uh, yeah, I'm with you. There's so many things that she should have. There's, there's so many red flags she should have caught if he was telling her all these stories. I mean, she should have asked him, now, why are we going to Venezuela? <laughs> Uh, you're being chased by cartel members. Why go to Venezuela? Why not go to a more secure place? If you're being chased by cartel members, why would you physically put yourself in closer proximity to where they are headquartered? There you go. That's yeah. my point. But, uh, you know, only she knows. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very objective person. Um, if I was asked to conduct that investigation as to whether she knew, I would probably find out that we were not asked to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So we, we just asked for that. We could have probably found out. And I, I, got, I saw some things in the beginning that, yeah, made me question that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she did admit ultimately that she was part of the insurance fraud scheme, that she did go to Venezuela with him, that she did know that he was faking his death. But she claimed the entire time that she was doing this in order to protect him and the family from the cartel. Yeah, I, I read the uh, I read I, I saw her interview with you, as a matter of fact. That's yeah, you know, again, she, she has to answer to one person only. When you look back on the case now, does it feel like some of this was really premeditated? Looking back at the entire case, it makes you wonder if he had been planning planning this well before he stayed, he traveled to Venezuela to stage his, his death. To be honest with you, I, I kind of feel bad for the guy. Uh, he had a beautiful family, beautiful kids, grandkids. And he risked a lot. I think he made a huge mistake. I think he's probably paid the price. Typically, people are motivated either by love, by money, greed. There's some motivations. And I think in this particular case, I think he got himself into a financial bind. I think he thought he was pretty smart and could get out of it. He knew some people that could possibly help him in Venezuela. And he probably thought, who in the world is going to go to travel to Venezuela and investigate this with all the riots and all the uh, all the uh, problems they were having? That would be Richard Marquez and his team. Absolutely. That's what we do. One of the biggest questions about this story is how is it possible that Daphne was so naive and didn't know what was really going on and what her husband was doing? This is what the children have to say. Do you blame her for having gotten herself in this position? You know, looking from the outside in, you're, you know, how could you be so naive? Why would you let this happen? You, you should have seen the signs, but being there and in the moment with him and how great of a con artist he was, he would have fooled anybody. Even though she served her time, Daphne remains under house arrest and must wear an ankle bracelet for three months. So Daphne, how far can you go outside? Just here, as far as I can go. She can leave only to go to church and hopes to find a job so she can somehow pay back the $871,000 Jose collected in insurance money. So now your mom is stuck with paying the restitution for both of them. Right, which I think is very unfair because even before she met Jose, my mom had a house, she had a home, she had vehicles, she had a career, she had her life together. Daphne is filing for divorce and refuses to answer the dozens of letters he has written to her from jail. It's just junk, it's just garbage in there. So that's when I started returning them and just saying, 
I don't want them. For what? To hear more lies? I lie to his wife as he did. That's nothing but cruel and barbaric because he turned her from being a person of good character to a person that's going to die as a felon. The ghost of Jose Lantigua finally busted. And as for Daphne, the fairy tale is broken. The glass slipper from her Prince Charming never fit. The fairy tale, <laughs> it doesn't exist. You know, Richard, the question that everyone asks is, was Daphne really that clueless? Did she really not know? And even after I sat with her for hours and with her crying and answering my questions, for the life of me, I still have my doubts. What do you think? Was she that clueless? Well, I've wondered that myself. I mean, considering her deep involvement in every aspect of, the, uh, of this staging the uh, death, it does make me wonder whether she was clueless. Yeah, I have to tell you, if the prosecutor had not come out so strongly and forcefully saying, no, she truly believed this, she is a victim here as well, even though she was charged with you know, the cashing in of the fraudulent insurance policies, because that part she did know. She did know that Jose yes. was indeed alive. So yes. that part the government did hold her accountable for. But I always found it interesting that the prosecutor defended Daphne only in the sense of saying he really believed that she believed Jose. And I think if it were not for the prosecutor saying that, I'd have even more doubts. Well, I still have my doubts, but, you know, I, I've talked to the uh, prosecutor multiple times. Uh, he was a very bright individual. Uh, he interviewed her multiple times where I, I personally didn't interview her. So I have to take uh, that he knew what he was doing and, and made the, the decision based on his own inquiries. I do believe there is one thing in Daphne's favor here that when you really want to find love and you have th and you think that you have found Prince Charming and he's rich and he's nice and he's helping your family. Once you think that you've found it all, I do believe people put on blinders and are willing to look the other way. I think there were always red flags, but Daphne was too happy in love to notice them. That's just my personal opinion. It, it's possible because we do uh, work a lot of cases where people fall, fall for uh, scams simply because they're in love and they don't want don't want to see anything else. And Jose needed Daphne to pull this off. Absolutely. Yes, he did. But so she, she could have been targeted. Enough. She was also bright enough and she had children that she, I'm sure she wanted to protect. And she went pretty far to help with the scheme. It makes me wonder as a parent, would you risk your life and your kids' lives in order to collect this insurance money? She claims that she did all of this to protect her children from the cartel. Well, only she knows. Mm -hmm. Only she knows the truth. You know, Richard, I always wondered, especially when I sat down and I interviewed Daphne, I always wondered whether he chose her for a reason because she was so excited to find love again that, and I think she's always wondered herself, you know, was I a patsy? Did he pick me for this scheme from the very beginning or did he really fall in love with me and then all this happened? Uh. I could only speculate. I have no idea. I've never, we never looked into that, but uh, it's possible. It's possible. He was smart, you know, smart enough. He knew he uh, had some problems. Um, did he really need her? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, did he really need her for this, to stage his death? I, I, I can only, only speculate that, that that's very possible. Well, Richard, let's let's talk about that because there needed to be a clear beneficiary. And so 
the easiest way to do this with the fewest number of people involved would be to have Daphne be the primary beneficiary. Otherwise, he would have to bring in all his other children into the scam. Well, that's true because uh, he needed somebody to go with him to Venezuela. And he knew that was a risky proposition. Probably did not want to get his kids involved in having to travel there. And that's possibly why he chose, chose her. In order to pull off this scheme, there had to be a very public funeral and the family in mourning. Now, as a parent, to put your child through something so painful as, as, as believing that your parent or your step-parent is dead, it seems so cruel. Do you think that the children suspected anything, the adult children? On a personal uh, level or personal perception, I have my doubts that, I mean, I, I feel like they probably knew. There are some things that we noticed that led me to believe that they probably knew he was still alive. What were those things? Well, as simple as the, uh, the trip that they took to the Bahamas. She took one of her daughters on that trip. They obviously met with him, right? So, well, we don't know. Did the daughter actually meet? What if the, what if the mother says, Hey honey, I'm going for a walk meets Jose down the block or around the corner. Isn't that possible? It's very possible. Yes. But I'm just, I, it's pure speculation on my part, but I mean, there's so many, I mean, his son testified in court. He appeared to be very nervous, which I mean, that's natural. But we saw other things that uh, lead me to believe that they probably were aware of this. And to be clear, the only two people who have ever been charged in this fraud case are Jose and Daphne, none of their children. No. And quite honestly, I felt terrible for their children because he put them in a terrible bind. They appear to be great kids. He actually, I mean, I, I saw where he used to hold a, a Bible study uh, class with his, with his kids, and he appeared to be a great dad. But I think desperation pushed him to, into doing this. Financial desperation. Do you think it's also fair Daphne basically was held accountable for restitution to pay the money back? And I do like this part of their sentencing. Neither one of them can make any money off of their story in any way. Because if they do, it's going to restitution. Well, it should. I mean, several companies paid them. And they bought a lot of, um, they bought some real estate and vehicles. And uh, I mean, they spent some of that money on some nice things. So. Play the game, <laughs> you got to pay, right? Let's talk about Daphne's sentence because she was sentenced and she did serve time. And then she was um, in home detention with an ankle monitor. I saw it all when I sat there and interviewed her. Do you think that her sentence was fair? To be honest with you, I never really paid much attention to that. As soon as he was arrested, I remember the night he was arrested. I was at home. It was a Sunday evening, enjoying dinner with my wife and my son. And in the back of my mind, I had that, I mean, I had that case in the back of my mind. I was getting ready to go into my office at home to get ready for another deposition, which depositions can be brutal, especially, especially when they're accusing you of wrongdoing. And I was pretty dejected. And I remember as soon as I, I sat down, I Googled his name and the story about his arrest came up. So we had a pretty good celebration that night because we were, we were definitely vindicated 
Well, that's the third and final episode in this amazing fraud case. Richard, thank you so much for taking us behind the scenes to tell us what was really going on, because I always wanted to know more. Even though I covered this case, I wanted to know more. I'm like hungry for the details. Well, I appreciate you having me on the show, and I hope I was able to uh, give, you, give you some additional details that were not uh, well known. Yeah, absolutely. Some great nuggets of behind the scenes information. So thank you all. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. As always, you know, you can find our content on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts, of course, on YouTube, and subscribe to our newsletter and to our YouTube channel. Until next time, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. <laughs>